Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa This evening I want to go through a sutta that I find very interesting. It's the Aganya Sutta, number 27 of the Diganakaya. It's the Sutta of Origins. Pretty much every religion or belief system in the world has a creation story of one kind or another, or an origin story. And this is the the Buddhist version. It's a little different from most of the other creation stories in that it's not creation story. There's no creator, but it's a story of origins. And it's not an ultimate origin either because there is no beginning to samsara. Uh, however far back you go in time, there's always a yesterday. So there's no ultimate beginning. But this is the beginning of our world system and the beginning of the human race and the beginning of human government and society. It has a number of uh, interesting features we'll, we'll uh, highlight as we go. The title of the Sutta Aganya, I think it's probably cognate with the name of the first book of the Bible, which is Genesis, which is a Greek word. So, Pali and Greek are both Indo-European languages, so gan or gen is probably a common element here. So, we'll begin. I'll read it and stop now and again to make a commentary. Thus have I heard which is Ewang Me Sutong, that's how most of the suttas start, that's Ananda speaking at the First Council. Thus have I heard, once the Lord was staying at Sawati, at the mansion of Migara's mother in the East Park. At that time, Vesata and Bharadvaja were living among the monks, hoping to become monks themselves. And in the evening, the Lord rose from his secluded meditation and came out of the mansion and started walking up and down in the shade. Vaseta noted this, and he said to Bharadvaja, Friend Bharadvaja, the Lord has come out and is walking up and down. Let us approach him. We might be fortunate enough to hear a talk on Dhamma from the Lord himself. Yes, indeed, said Bharadvaja. So they went up to the Lord and saluted him and fell in step with him. Then the Lord said to Vaseta, Vaseta, you too are Brahmins, born and bred, and you have gone forth from the household life into homelessness from Brahmin families. Do not the Brahmins revile and abuse you? Indeed, Lord, the Brahmins do revile and abuse us. They don't hold back with their usual flood of reproaches. Well, Vaseta, what kind of reproaches do they fling at you? Lord, what the Brahmins say is this, the Brahman caste is the highest caste, other castes are base. The Brahman caste is fair, other castes are dark. Brahmins are purified, non-Brahmins are not. The Brahmins are the true children of Brahma, born from his mouth, born of Brahma, created by Brahma, heirs of Brahma. And you, you have deserted the highest class and gone over to the base class of shaveling petty ascetics. Servants, dark fellows, born of Brahma's foot. It is not right, it is not proper for you to mix with such people. This is the way the Brahmins abuse us, Lord. So it starts out with um, the Buddha in conversation with these two Brahmins and a uh, indication of Brahmin caste pride and arrogance. And this is one of the themes of the sutta, is to undermine the Brahmin pretensions. And this uh, 
is one interpretation that the the Buddhist uh, scholar Gombrich has um, written about this sutta that the whole thing is kind of a parody of the Brahmins. I think that's a bit strong. I think there's a lot more in this sutta, but that's certainly one aspect here, this critique of the Brahmin view. Thus, Vaseta, the Brahmins have forgotten their ancient tradition when they say that, this is the Buddha speaking, because we can see Brahmin women, the wives of Brahmins, who menstruate and become pregnant, have babies and give suck. And yet these womb-born Brahmins talk about being born from Brahma's mouth. These Brahmins misrepresent Brahma, tell lies and earn much demerit. So the Buddha is mocking the Brahmins' pretension, who says that the Brahmins come from Brahma's mouth. The um, myth in the Vedic tradition was that at the creation of the world, the four castes emerged from the body of Brahma, who was the supreme god. This is one of the creation myths found in the pre-Buddhist literature. There are other versions. And the Brahmins, the highest caste, emerge from Brahma's mouth, the Kshatriya, or the warrior caste, from his shoulders, the um, uh, Vesya, or uh, merchant class, from his belly, and the Suddhas, or working class, from his feet. And the Buddha is saying, well, you know, I know Brahmins, and they didn't come from Brahma's mouth, they came from their mother in the ordinary way. And then the Buddha goes on. There are, Vasetha, these four castes, the Katyas, the Brahmas, the merchants, and the artisans. And sometimes a Katya takes life, takes what is not given, commits sexual misconduct, tell lies, indulges in slander. Harsh speech or idle chatter is grasping, malicious, of wrong view. Thus such things as are immoral and considered so, blameworthy and considered so, to be avoided and considered so, Ways unbefitting an Aryan and considered so, black with black result and blamed by the wise, are sometimes to be found among the Katyas, and the same applies to the Brahmins, merchants, and artisans. One thing to note here is that the Buddha changes the order of the castes, and this is consistent throughout. Whenever the Buddha speaks about castes, he always puts the Katyas or Kshatriyas at the top position, the Brahmins in second position. And he identifies here uh, being an um, Aryan with uh, good behavior rather than with birth. Sometimes, too, a Katya refrains from taking life, is not grasping malicious or of wrong view. Thus, such things as are moral and considered so, blameless and considered so, to be followed and considered so, ways befitting an Aryan and considered so, bright with bright results, and praised by the wise, are sometimes to be found among the Kachis, and likewise among the Brahmins, merchants, and artisans. Now, since both dark and bright qualities, which are blamed and praised by the wise, are scattered indiscriminately amongst the four castes, the wise do not recognize the claim about the Brahmin caste being the highest. Why is that? Because, Vaseta, anyone from the four castes who becomes a monk, an arahant, who has destroyed the corruptions, who has lived the life, done what has to be done, laid down the burden, reached the highest goal, destroyed the fetter of becoming, and become emancipated, emancipated through super-knowledge. He is proclaimed supreme by virtue of Dhamma and not of non-Dhamma. Then there's a stanza of verse, Dhamma is the best thing for people in this life and the next as well. This illustration make clear to you how Dhamma is best in this world and the next. King Pasanedi of Kosala knows the ascetic Gotama has gone forth from the neighboring clan of the Sakyans. Now the Sakyans are vassals of the king of Kosala. They offer him humble service and salute him, rise and do homage and pay him fitting service. And just as the Sakyans offer the king humble service, so likewise does the king offer humble service to the Tathagata, thinking, if the ascetic Gautama is well-born, I am ill-born. 
If the ascetic gatama is strong, I am weak. If the ascetic gatama is pleasant to look at, I am ill-favored. If the ascetic gatama is influential, I am of little influence. Now it is because of honoring the Dhamma, making much of the Dhamma, esteeming the Dhamma, doing reverent homage to the Dhamma, that King Pasanedi does humble service to the Tathagata and pays him fitting service. Dhamma is the best thing for people in this life and the next as well. Vaseta, all of you, though of different birth, name, clan, and family, who have gone forth from the household life into homelessness, if you are asked who you are, should reply, We are ascetics, followers of the Sakyan. He whose faith in the Tathagata is settled, rooted, established, solid, unshakable by any ascetic or Brahmin, any Deva or Mara or Brahma or anyone in the world, can truly say, I am a true son of the Blessed One, born of his mouth, born of the Dhamma, created by Dhamma, an heir of the Dhamma. Why is that? Because, Vaseta, this designates the Tathagata, the body of Dhamma, that is, the body of Brahma, or become Dhamma, that is, become Brahma. So Brahma was considered the supreme deity. And the Buddha is saying here that the Tathagata and the Dhamma and Brahma are all being somewhat equated. So one who is gone forth into the dispensation of the Buddha can claim to be born of the mouth of the Buddha and metaphorically because he's following the teachings spoken by the Buddha. And then well, having this um, initial, this is the kind of the introductory portion of the sutta where the Buddha establishes the, that he's uh, critiquing the, the Brahman caste pride and caste pretensions. And then he goes on in the next section to deal with the origin of the world system with a quite different mythological basis than that found in, in the Vedas. Now, I'd like to you know, say something about the value of, of, of myth. I can't remember who, who said it, but somebody said once, and I, it struck me as very good, that there are things that are true, but they're not real. And there are things that are real, but they're not true. So there are people in the world who have a attitude towards mythological stories or content that they're of no value. They say, well, it's not true, it didn't happen. So as if there's, it's, what's the use of, of learning it or hearing it? And there are other people, not so many nowadays, but there are other people who want to take all the mythological content literally. And either approach is very narrow and, and uh, misguided. Myths can express very profound truths without being real in the sense of like a real historical event. And this myth, I think, has a lot to say about the nature of the world and the nature of beings. So he begins, There comes a time, Vaseta, when sooner or later, after a long period, this world contracts. At the time of contraction, beings are mostly born in the Abhisara Brahma world. So what he's talking about here is the long cycle of the cosmology multiple world systems go through phases of contraction and expansion. And during contraction phase, worlds are destroyed. And if they are destroyed by fire, which is most of the cycles, majority of the cycles, the worlds are destroyed by fire, it destroys everything up to the first Brahma level. And the last world system that's that's or the lowest world system that's that's left is the second jhana level of the abhisara brahmas and 
everything below that, the, the human realm and the realms of the Devas and the realms of the the first jhana brahmas, they're all destroyed by fire. And that's the contraction of the world system. It's destroyed from the bottom up. And then it comes back into being from the top down. That's the expansion of the world system. So there comes a time, Vasetha, when this world contracts. At a time of contraction, beings are mostly born in the Abhisara Brahma world. The Abhisara Brahmas are uh, glorious, um, luminous Brahmas of the level of the second jhana. And all the beings from the lower realms are mostly born into that because there's, that's the lowest spot they could be born. And the Abhisara Brahma's consciousness is the equivalent of second jhana, which is marked by the factors of, of rapture and bliss, but without thought conception. And there they dwell, mind-made, feeding on the light, self-luminous, moving through the air, glorious. And that's a formula that occurs often in description of these Brahmas. Mind-made, Manomaya, feeding on the light, which is a pitibaka, feeding on piti. So they don't eat ordinary food, they feed on, on uh, jhanic bliss. Self-luminous, moving through the air, glorious. And they stay like that for a very long time. But sooner or later, after a very long period, this world begins to expand again. At a time of expansion, the beings from the Abhisara Brahma world, having passed away from there, are mostly reborn in this world. Here they dwell, mind made, feeding on the light, self-luminous, moving through the air, glorious. And they stay like that for a very long time. So, when the lifespan of the, the Abhisara Brahmas reaches its end, they're reborn. But initially, their, their form is very much the same. But they're reborn in the presence of this physical earth, not in the, in the Brahma world. At this period, Vaseta, there was just one mass of water and all was darkness, blinding darkness. Neither moon nor sun appeared. And the, the Pali there would be um, moon or sun is not evident. It doesn't say they didn't exist, but they were not evident. They were not manifested, not perceived. No constellations or stars appeared. Night and day were not distinguished nor months and fortnights, nor seasons and years. And no male and female beings, beings just being recognized as beings. And sooner or later, after a very long period of time, savory earth, that is Oja in Pali, spread itself over the waters where those beings were. It looked just like the skin that forms itself over hot milk as it cools. It was endowed with color, smell, and taste. It had the color of fine ghee or butter, and it was very sweet, like pure wild honey. So there's some really interesting parallels here to the modern scientific cosmological conception of the early Earth, that it was dark, you know, covered in heavy cloud cover, was unformed and the entire surface of the earth was covered in ocean and it said that at some point there appeared on the surface of the water this oja nutritious foam then some being of a greedy nature said I say what can this be and he tasted the savory earth on its finger in so doing, it became taken with the flavor and craving arose in it. Then other beings, taking their cue from this one, also tasted the stuff with their fingers. They too were taken with the flavor and craving arose in them. So they set to it with their hands, breaking off pieces of the stuff in order to eat it. And the result of this was that their self-luminous disappeared. And as a result of the disappearance of their self-luminance, the sun and moon appeared 
Night and day were distinguished. Months and fortnights appeared, and the years and seasons. To this extent, the world re-evolved. So this is a very critical paragraph and a critical transition. And there is here a uh, interesting parallel with the story of Genesis in the Bible, because the fall, the initial fall, is due to the sense of taste and the desire for the apple in the Garden of Eden, or in here, the Brahmas wanting to taste the uh, the oja. So the, it also indicates that these beings were not, were had already fallen spiritually from their initial state, because a, a, a Brahma god doesn't have any sensual desire and doesn't indeed have even a sense of taste. So they had already fallen to some lower state to even take an interest in the Oja. But once they in- take the taste of the Oja, then they, uh, they, they fall. They're no longer these luminous beings floating in the air, but they fall to earth. This is the, and this, to me, I see this as symbolic of consciousness entering into physical matter or coarse, gross matter. There's a kind of fine matter in the Brahma realms, but here we have like a refined level of consciousness descending into the sense-desire level consciousness becoming entangled in the material world. And those beings continued for a very long time, feasting on this savory earth, feeding on it and becoming nourished by it. And as they did so, their bodies became coarser, and a difference in looks developed among them. Some became good-looking, others ugly. And the good-looking ones despised the others, saying, we are better looking than they are. And because they became arrogant and conceited about their looks, the savory earth disappeared. At this they came together and lamented, crying, Oh, that flavor! Oh, that flavor! So nowadays when people say, Oh, that flavor, when they get something nice, they are repeating an ancient saying without realizing it. So that was probably uh, some cliche or catchphrase that was common in at the time, oh, that flavor, oh, that flavor. And the, uh, here is kind of a just-so story explaining how the, this is actually a very ancient phrase. We see here also in this, uh, which is the first, first of several stages of devolution of these beings, that it's very tied in with morality. The state of refinement of these beings is tied in with their moral behavior. So once they develop arrogance and conceit about their good looks, then they, they begin, that's the first stage of them declining. And we also have the beginning of differentiation as some of them become better looking than others. And we also have the, uh, the decline of the food supply or the devolution of the food supply together with the devolution of the beings. And then when the savory earth had disappeared, a fungus cropped up in the manner of a mushroom. It was of good color, smell, and taste. It was the color of fine gear butter, and it was very sweet, like pure wild honey. And those beings set to and ate the fungus, and this lasted for a very long time. And as they continued to feed on the fungus, so their bodies became coarser still, and the difference in their looks increased still more. And the good-looking ones despised the others, And because they became arrogant and conceited about their looks, the sweet fungus disappeared. And next, creepers appeared, shooting up like bamboo. And these too were very sweet, like pure wild honey. And these beings set to and fed on the creepers. And as they did so, their bodies became even coarser. And the difference in their looks increased still more. And they became still more arrogant. And so the creepers disappeared too. And... At this they came together and lamented, crying, Alas, our creeper's gone. What have we lost? So nowadays when people being asked um, why they were upset, say, Oh, what we have lost. They are repeating an ancient saying without knowing it. 
Then, after the creepers had disappeared, rice appeared in the open spaces, free from powder and husks, fragrant and clear-grained. And what they had taken in the evening for supper had grown again and was ripe in the morning. And what they had taken in the morning for breakfast was ripe again in the evening with no sign of reaping. So this is kind of a first appearance of, of grain, of rice. And at the early times, it, it grew already like husk, like white rice, ready to cook. And whatever they picked in the morning was back again by the evening. And the, the beings set to and fed on the rice, and this lasted for a very long time. And as they did so, their bodies became coarser still, and the difference in their looks became even greater. And the females developed sex organs, and the males developed male organs. And the women became excessively preoccupied with men, and the men became excessively preoccupied with women. Owing to this excessive preoccupation with each other, passion was aroused, and their bodies burnt with lust. That was a, a, a note in the commentaries um, that uh, explaining this biological uh, uh, differentiation into the sexes. And according to the commentary, it actually began with uh, the necessary, uh, uh, necessary function of excretion. Once the food had developed to this coarse level of ordinary grain, the beings had to excrete their waste and this o openings appeared in their body to do this and then they, uh, they gradually became a differentiation between uh, male bodies and female bodies. Because before the Brahma beings have no, no gender so before this there was no gender differentiation and there was no sex. Owing to this excessive preoccupation with each other, passion was aroused and their bodies burned with lust. And later, because of this burning, they indulged in sexual activity. But those who saw them indulging threw dust, ashes or cow dung at them, crying, Die, you filthy beast! How can one being do such things to another? Just as today, in some districts, when a daughter-in-law is led out, some people throw dirt at her, some ashes and some cow dung, without realizing they are repeating an ancient observance. What was once considered bad form in those days is now considered good form. So I guess it was a custom at marriages at the time to throw ash or something on the like we have throwing rice. Maybe throw throw ash on the on the couple or the, at least the bride. And here's the story of the the origin of it. That, the beings who had not yet developed sexual differentiation were disgusted by the ones who, who did. How can you do this disgusting act to each other and try to drive them away by throwing, throwing clods of dirt at them or whatever? And those beings who in those days indulged in sex were not allowed into the village or town for one or two months. Accordingly, those who indulged for an excessively long period in such immoral practice began to build themselves dwellings so as to indulge under cover. So this is the origin of, of houses and, and desire for seclusion and privacy, which before hadn't, hadn't been an issue. It's kind of like the loss of innocence in the, um, in the biblical story. When in the biblical story in the Garden of Eden, after the fall, for the first time, Adam and Eve became ashamed of their nakedness and covered themselves with, with fig leaves. Now it occurs to one of these beings who is inclined to laziness, Well now, why should I be bothered to gather rice in the evening for supper and in the morning for breakfast? Why shouldn't I gather it all at once for both meals? And he did so. Then another one came to him and said, Come on, let's go rice gathering. No need, my friend, I've gathered enough for both meals. Then the other, following his example, gathered enough rice for two days at a time, saying, That should be about enough. Then another being came and said unto the second one, Come, let us go rice gathering. No need, my friend, I've gathered enough for two days. And then it, the same thing repeats up to four days and up to eight days. However, when those beings 
made a store of rice and lived on that, husk powder and husk began to envelop the grain. And where it was reaped, it did not grow again. And the cut place showed, and the rice grew in separate clusters. So this is the, uh, by overtaxing their uh, food supply, they caused a further degeneration in the, in the, in the plant life, and it degenerated into the modern rice as we know it today that requires a lot of labor to get from um, the first planting to, to your rice pot. So I think this here is symbolic or um, actually not very far, not very, uh, not very far from the actuality of the beginning of agriculture. Transition from hunting and gathering to agriculture. And when those beings came together lamenting, wicked ways have become rife amongst us. First we were mind made feeding on delight, and then all events are repeated down to the latest each change being said to be due to wicked and unwholesome ways. And the rice grows in separate clusters. So now let us, let us divide up the rice into fields with boundaries. And so they did. So now this, with the, the introduction of agriculture, there um, becomes a necessity of the invention of private property. And these things are seen as not advances, but as degenerations from a state of... Uh, primitive innocence. Then Vaseta, one greedy natured being, while watching over his own plot, took another plot that was not given to him and enjoyed the fruits of it. So they seized hold of him and said, you've done a wicked thing, taking another's plot like that. Don't do ever such a thing again. I won't, he said, but he did. The same thing again, a second and a third time. Again he was seized and rebuked, and some hit him with their fists, and some with stones, and some with sticks. And in this way, they say that taking what was not given and censuring and lying and punishment took their origin. So with private property, theft arises, crime arises, violence arises. Then those who came together and lamented the arising of these evil things among them, taking what was not given, censuring, lying and punishment. And they, they said, suppose we were to appoint a certain being who would show anger where anger was due, censure those who deserved it, and banish those who deserved banishment, and in return we would grant him a share of the rice. So they went to one among them, who was the handsomest, the best looking, the most pleasant and capable, and asked him to do this for him in return for a share of the rice, and he agreed. So, so this is the beginning of government, which is seen as a kind of a necessary evil. It wouldn't be necessary if, if everyone behaved themselves, but because there's thieves and there's violence, you know, we need somebody to be in charge here. And I find it's kind of amusing that when they elect or choose a leader of the characteristics they look for, only one, one of the last one mentioned is capable. The others are best looking, handsomest, most pleasant. You know, it's kind, of, kind of reminiscent of elections now. The people's choice is the name of Mahasamata, which is the regular title to be introduced. So this first leader was given, given the name of Mahasamata, and this is said to be the first king. And later um, Buddhist royalty in India concocted genealogies tracing their, their line all the way back to Mahasamata. The Mahasamata was the the uh, the father of all the the kings of of India according to their later later genealogies. Lord of the fields is the meaning of Katya. The second such title, so Katya or Kshatriya in Sanskrit is the name of the warrior caste who the, who were the aristocrats or landowners as well, and the king would of course always be a Katya. And uh, the entomology is given here as Lord of the Fields. The second such title, and the gladdens others with Dhamma, is the meaning of Raja. Now, these are kind of 
a bit far-fetched etymologies. This is a common thing in Pali that uh, this kind of word play. Uh, the word raja could uh, has some similarity to uh, the word rajati for rejoicing. So we're saying that the meaning of it is gladdens others with dhamma. And then vasata, this then vasata is the origin of the class of katyas in accordance with ancient titles that were introduced for them. They originated amongst these very same beings, like ourselves, no different, in accordance with dhamma, not otherwise. So he's saying here, there isn't any special birth for the katya class. It was a pragmatic decision of the people at the time that they needed somebody to keep order, so they established a, a king and then eventually a whole class of, of uh, warriors whose function was to protect the community. But their origin is not some special creation, but they, they came out of the ordinary people originally. Dhamma is the best thing for people in this life and the next as well. And then he goes on to talk about the origin of the other castes. Then some of these beings thought evil things have appeared amongst beings, such as taking what is not given, censuring, lying, punishment, and banishment. We ought to put aside evil and unwholesome things, and they did so. They put aside evil and unwholesome things is the meaning of Brahman. This is another far-fetched kind of stretch of wordplay. They put away evil and unwholesome things is the meaning of Brahman, which is the first regular title to be introduced for such people. And they made leaf huts in forest places and meditated in them. With the smoking fire gone out, with pestle and uh, with pestle cast aside, gathering alms for their evening and morning meals, they went away to a village, town, or royal city to seek their food, and when they returned to their leaf huts to meditate, people saw this and noted how they meditated. They meditated is the meaning of jayaka, which is the second regular title to be introduced. So he, he, uh, he sees the origin of the Brahmins here as being like the Samanas. They were originally uh, ascetics, living in leaf huts and meditating and seeking alms food. So very much like the ascetic tradition or the Samana tradition. However, some of these beings, not being able to meditate in leaf huts, settled around towns and villages and compiled books. People saw them doing this and not meditating. Now those who do not meditate is the meaning of ajayaka, which is a uh, really kind of a mischievous play on words because that actually means like a learned Brahmin would be given this title, which is the third regular title to be introduced. At that time, it was regarded as a low designation, but now it is the higher. See, the Brahmins who were well learned, they would get the title of uh, Ajayaka. This then, Vasada, is the origin of the class of Brahmins, in according with the ancient titles that were introduced for them. The origin was from among those very beings, like themselves, no different, and in accordance with Dhamma, not otherwise. And then... Now he goes on to the origin of the merchant class, the Vesas. And then the said that some of these beings having paired off, adopted various trades, and this various is the meaning of Vesa, which came to be the regular title for such people. This then is the origin of the class of Vesas, in accordance with the ancient titles that were introduced for them. Their origin was from among these very same beings. Historically, the original Aryans, when they came into India, they brought the caste system with them. There were originally three castes, and the Vesas were the, the lowest class, they were, and they were the mostly cattle herders, and the economy was based on livestock. Later, they became the merchant class, and the Sudhas, who are, were descended from the non-Aryan uh, inhabitants of, of India, became conquered and established as the lowest class of the Sudhas. Now that's the historical account of the origin of the four castes, but um, here in the Sutta it goes on, and then the Seta, those beings who remained, went in for hunting. 
They are base who live by the chase. That is the meaning of Suda, which came to be the regular title for such people. This then is the origin of the class of Suddhas, in accordance with the ancient titles that were introduced for them. Their origin was from among these very same beings. So we seeing the Suddhas as being hunters, they probably were uh, a lot of in the, once they, once the Aryans passed the Indus Valley and got into the Ganges, it probably were the people there were on a more primitive level. There was probably a lot of hunter-gatherers. So he sees the, the Suddhas as, the, as being those who live by the chase. Maurice Walsh, in his footnotes here, he makes a kind of a, a comical observation to, from his British point of view. He says that... Uh, um, I wonder how our British aristocrats would take this, uh, because like hunting was um, sort of a privilege of the aristocrats in European society, and in, in England you had like the fox hunt. Right? It's an aristocratic game, and, and here is like the lowest thing. But we fe- see this in the in the Buddhist stories generally, like in the Jatakas, that hunters are always despised and like a very low, a very low kind of occupation. And then Vasetha, it came about that some Katya, dissatisfied with his own Dhamma, went forth from the home life into homelessness, thinking I will become an ascetic, or in Pali a Samana. And a Brahman did likewise, and a Vesa did likewise, and so did a Sudha. And from these four classes, the class of ascetics, Samanas, came into existence. Their origin was from these same beings, like themselves no different, in accordance with Dhamma, not otherwise. So he's now in the Indian society, there was outside the caste system were the Samanas, were the religious seekers. And the Buddha is saying that they, they could come from any one of the four castes. This was always a, uh, a tension between the Brahmins, who were hereditary priesthood, and the Samanas, who were uh, individual from any caste who went forth and, and practiced religious austerities. And this was considered by the orthodox Brahmins, this was considered to be kind of a very, very heretical and, and uh, unapproved. And there's a story in, in uh, I think it's in the laws of Manu, in one of the Hindu texts later period, when the caste system was becoming more rigid. There's a story of um, one of the incarnations of, of, of uh, Vishnu who uh, came across the Sudha uh, doing Hatha Yoga, standing on his head, and he killed him for you know, breaking the caste laws, chopped his head off. And so Visita Akacha, who's had a bad life and has, uh, in body, speech, and thought, who has had wrong view, will, in consequence of such views and deeds, at the breaking up of the body after death, be reborn in a state of loss, an ill fate, the downfall, the hell state. So too will a Brahma, a Vasa, or a Sudha. Likewise, a Katya, who has led a good life in body, speech, and thought, and who has had a right view, in consequence of such right view and deeds, at the breaking up of his body after death, will be reborn in a good destiny, in a heaven state. So too will a Brahma, a Vesa, or a Sudha. And so, a Katya who has performed deeds of both kinds, in body, speech, and thought, and his view is mixed, will, in consequence of such mixed views and deeds, at the break up of the body after death, experience both pleasure and pain. So too will a Brahman, a Vesa, or a, Kat, or a Sudha. And a Katya who is restrained in body, speech, and thought, and who has developed the seven requisites of enlightenment, will attain to Parinibbana in this very life. So too will a Brahma, a Vesa, or a Sudha. And the Seta, whoever of these four castes, as a monk, becomes Arahant, destroyed the corruptions, done what is to be done, laid down the burden, attained to the goal, completely destroyed the fetter of becoming, and become liberated by the highest insight, he is declared to be chief among those in accordance with Dhamma and not otherwise. 
the Seta, it was the Brahma Sanan Kumara who spoke the verse. The Katya is best among those who value clan. He with knowledge and conduct is the best of gods and men. The verse was rightly sung, not wrongly spoken, connected with prophet, not unconnected. I too say the Seta, the Katya is best among those who value clan. He with knowledge of conduct is best of gods and men. And thus the Lord spoke, and Vesetta and Baraja were delighted and rejoiced at his words. So this last little bit, we can I think we can take from this that in this critique of the, the caste system, the Buddha was not actually uh, seeking the end or the abolishment of the caste system. And we see this elsewhere that he'll talk about the um, the caste system. He wants to make clear that it's not a divine institution, but it's a human pragmatic arrangement that has its value as a way of organizing society. But it's not an absolute value. It's not a divinely inspired value, but a pragmatic human one. And he, he makes the point always that the Kachis should be considered the, the top caste, not the Brahmins. The Brahmins usurped that position. So the verse of Sanan Kumara, the Kachya is the two, uh, two lines in the verse. The first one is mundane, dealing with ordinary affairs on the conventional level. So, the, well, the Kachya is on top. But then he goes on to the higher level, or the the more transcendent level. And he says, but he with knowledge and conduct, you know, Vijaya and Charana, Vijaya and Charana, Sampati is in the, the chant. He with knowledge and conduct is the best of gods and men. So that always trumps any, any, uh, ordinary, mundane, pragmatic arrangement humans make. The important thing is the keeping of morality and the developing of the mind. And the highest status is accorded to one who has attained to arhanship. So this sutta deals with the, uh, the origin of the world system, the origin of the human race and the origin of the caste system and human society. It's, it's interesting as taken as a whole in a number of ways. One is that it does imply a evolution, or more strictly speaking, a devolution. There's a change, a, a continual change from the beginning to now. It isn't a, it isn't a one-off immediate creation like in Genesis. So it does acknowledge change happening. And it ties the the level of the beings with with their morality, and this becomes even more clear in um, uh, another sutta that immediately precedes this one and kind of paired with it. Usually, is the uh, uh, Chakawati Sutta that deals with the um, the future. Like this one deals with the past, the other sutta deals with the future, and it talks about human beings going through cycles of declining morality together with declining uh, lifespan. And human beings at the beginning, when they first were in this kind of Brahma stage, they were said to have a lifespan of 80,000 years. And then that degenerates through the increasing accumulation of defilements and wrongdoing. It declines through 10 years. And we're said to be on a downslope now. And then after it bottoms out at 10 years, there'll be a seven-day period of what they call the sword time, when everybody just acts like wild beasts and starts killing each other. And there'll be very few survivors, and they'll... Uh, emerge and say, why don't we just stop killing each other? And so they take the first precept, and that's the first moral act that begins the 
upcycle. And every generation, they, they acquire new, new precepts and new uh, good morality. It's the reverse, the mirror image of the downslope. And every generation increases in lifespan until they get up back up to 80,000 years. And the next time human lifespan is at 80,000 years, Maitya Buddha is supposed to come. So this is a mythological framework that explains the origins of, uh, of human beings. And one very important concept to take away from this is the, 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 uh, the origin of humans from the Abhisara Brahma realm through the, uh, the agency of becoming entangled in sense desire. Is when we practice jhana meditation, we are elevating our consciousness to a Brahma level. And there's a deep sense in um, taken from these myths that the state of mind of being in jhana is actually not something new or additional to our consciousness, but is a, a natural, native, primordial state of mind. And we're act, in a way, we're actually just remembering remembering what it's like to be an Abhisara Brahma. So I'll leave it at that. That's the uh, Aganya Sutta, number 27, So I am very interested in this sort of thing because I was trained in a tradition where this sort of thing was very important, namely Neoplatonism. Mm -hmm. um, so first I want to ask about the cosmological aspects of this, and then I have okay. a quick question about the uh, caste system and okay. the, the reversal of the Brahma class with the Kshatriya class. Yeah. Um, and I'll try to get this over quickly. So. I noticed at the beginning that the world dissolution that is described mm -hmm. occurs at the level where the first jhana plane begins and everything down below that. Yes. So the second, third, fourth, and formless attainments, is there ever any description of a dissolution of these, like the, the realms the, themselves? Um, the, uh, the cycle of world destructions is rather complicated. Um, but most of the, just, just without getting into all the numerical details, the, the majority of the, the destructions are by fire. And it begins at the, at the earth level and destroys everything above up to first Brahma. But then there's a, a, a more rare type of destruction that occurs uh, by water, which destroys everything up to second level. And then a, a type of destruction by wind that destroys everything up to third level. And the fourth level is uh, never uh, is never annihilated in that way, but it's said it, um, that it, that doesn't violate the law of impermanence because it's, it's incorrect to consider it actually as a level. They're separate, um, in the ultimate sense, it isn't really a place. It's the separate dwellings of the, of the fourth level uh, Brahmas. And each one of those expires when the Brahma's lifespan runs out. But the, the whole thing is not destroyed at once. Um, th there's a, in the Abhidharma Kosha, there's an interesting relationship established between the jhanas and these cycles of destruction. That the fire is equated with thought formation. And when thought formation is eliminated, then you you uh, enter a second jhana, and when uh, piti is equated with water, and when that's eliminated, then you go to the third level, and when breath is eliminated, you go into fourth level. Because it was held by um, the ancient Buddhists of most schools that in fourth jhana there's no breath. 
And the uh, four formless attainments, I'm, I've always been a bit puzzled about this, but would the four formless attainments be sort of contained within the fourth jhana, rather than well, being they're up? in Abhidhamma terms, they're considered to be extrapolations from fourth jhana, but they're okay. they're separate realms. They're they're also considered separate realms of existence. They're not. They're only considered to be extrapolations of fourth jhana because they have the same jhana factors of of uh, one pointedness and um, equanimity. But they they're different from the fourth fourth jhana or any jhana because there's no form. Okay, so the next question that I have is just uh, you mentioned that this cycle has no beginning in time. So yeah, every one of these levels is characterized by temporality. Yes. Okay, so. Because of that, it's probably, even though there is description of ascent and descent, there is hierarchy here. Yes. There is no single location of origination? No. Okay. Now, when the, uh, the hierarchy of jhanas and formless attainments are described, uh, the cessation of perception or feeling, the attainment of nibbana, is sometimes described as transcending this cycle. Would it be yes. inaccurate to consider this a realm in the sense that the lower realms are? Um, no, not in the same sense. It's, it's just for purposes of classification. In the Ad Dhamma, they talk about four levels of, of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Sense, desire, form, formless, and Nibbana. But it always makes clear that Nibbana is entirely outside the, the system. And it's it not, is part of the system in the sense that you rise into it, but the distinction would be that there is no descent out of it? Um, yeah, you, well, you enter into it, uh, but it's not necessarily, you don't necessarily have to go through all the levels to get to Nibbana. Mm -hmm. uh, you can transition into Nibbana from the human level. So in spatial terms, everything before that is up and down, but Nibbana is kind of like a side term? Yeah, well, the Sensual desire realm and the form realm are arrayed spatially, mm. but the formless realm is not because it's outside of space. It doesn't have a real relation to space. Yes, I, I, I just meant it in metaphor. Yeah, yes, yeah, 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 okay. Okay. Would Nibbana for this reason be considered non-temporal? Yes, a calico. Okay. So, that's interesting. Um, and there is never at any point any sort of description for the origination of this cycle at all. It's simply no. phenomenological. It's just given. Yeah, it just is. and There's no temporal origin. Um, in terms of um, explanation, like in the dependent origination, it's... Uh, that said that the that ignorance is the, the is the origin, but not a temporal sense. Like, but it could, everything would be traced back to ignorance. If if Just it wasn't it. for ignorance, there wouldn't be any samsara. Right. Okay. So interesting stuff. The other question that I have is about the caste system and the reversal of the kshatriya and the brahman yes. class. Yes. Yes. So. It seems as though he's saying that the Kshatriya class, most properly, should be the governing class, the class with social power. Well, it should be. Yeah, well, it already is. But he's saying it should also be considered the, the highest class in terms of respect and honors. It <laughs> should trump the uh, Brahman class, which was probably the original Aryan arrangement. That the the uh, the lords, the kings, were the um, uh, the uh, the dominant caste, and the the brahmins were their servants, like their ritual servants who did ritual for them. And then the the brahmins kind of uh, usurped the top position, mm -hmm. and and it's kind of a we're trying to turn things into a theocracy. You know? Right. So, the reason that I ask about that is just because I found it interesting that the origins of the Brahmin class were described as the origins of just ascetic wanderers. Yes, yeah. Um, 
So I'm wondering, do you think that the reason that the Buddha would have seen it inappropriate to put them in charge, do you think it would have been because he would have seen it as inappropriate to put uh, religious uh, authorities, such as the Buddha himself was, into positions of political power? Yeah, I think that's that's kind of yeah that's kind of the point that that it's like they're they're going into the wrong sphere you know the the, the katyas have the sphere of of ordinary mundane worldly rulership and i was considered a necessity because of the fallen nature of the beings that they were stealing and killing each other and so okay now we need somebody with a big stick to keep order here so they elect a mahasamadha and you know that's not the job of the brahmins they should be you know doing religious stuff so in terms of the ordering of the hierarchy of society the katyas should be on top and the samanas he adds the samanas in at the end as a separate like they're outside the caste system so they're not ranked in the hierarchy they come from all four castes and they separate themselves from the caste system and he would presumably be including the Buddhist Sangha in Yes, that yeah. Outside. The Buddhist Sangha was definitely considered by the Buddha himself and his disciples and by everyone else as a subgroup of the Samanas. Why do you suppose he would have said that uh, the Brahmins, even in a uh, lowered state, would have still had a place in broader society? Why not just replace them with the sun? <laughs> well, I, th I probably, I'm kind of speculating here, but he probably didn't want that. I mean, that's what kind of happened in, in Theravada Buddhist countries like Sri Lanka and Thailand. The, the ritual uh, services performed by bhikkhus, previously performed by Brahmins, and that shouldn't even really be the place of the bhikkhus. They're there to seek, you know, seek uh, higher states of consciousness and... You no, know, and at, at most relating to the the lady is teaching dhamma, but they're not really supposed to be doing blessing ceremonies and you know um, you know all this kind of um, ritual ritual procedures that people want and kind of psychologically need. And the the, the brahmins fill that role. So they're kind of doing the dirty work. The necessary dirty work. Well, it's not and dirty so... work if it's done. You know, if it's done in the right spirit, it's not dirty work. It's it's, a, but it's not. It's considered a lower than a, like meditating and developing higher states of consciousness. It, it, but it's still like a spiritual activity. I wouldn't call it dirty work. That's not fair. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Just a short question. I, I can only half follow when I'm doing this, but how did this uh, start falling down from Brahma, the luminous? And yeah, the, well, uh, the way it's the a, first thing they did wrong. The, well, they were <laughs> at the end of the previous world cycle, there was no place for beings to be born except the, the lowest place they could be born was in Abhisar Brahma realm. So there was a lot of beings in that realm that probably just really didn't have the spiritual quality to maintain their existence there. And then the next time they were reborn, they, they were reborn in the presence of the earth, yeah. but they still had this kind of form of Brahma beings because that's all there was at the time. But they immediately became interested in physical matter and wanted to, you know, get, oh, what's that stuff on the ocean? Let's try it, you know. So then they involved themselves in matter, they fell from their state. Right. So just only the contact alone was enough? Yes. Yes. Why is it that the, the Buddha appears on the the ascent, like after the lifespan, the 80 well, this, lifespan? Well, this Gautama Buddha appeared on the descent. Right, okay. Maybe it's supposed to come next time at the peak. Like the end of this ascent, right at the peak. And he's the last one in this world age. And then after the last ascent, there won't be any more rising in this world.
why is it that the ascent of morality destroys the world? The, the, no, this is the other way around. The descent of morality. You said that the, when um, everyone is reborn in the higher realms, yeah. when the earth is destroyed, yeah. is this when um, sort of the seven days of all the killing... And no, no, that's, that's like the... You're mixing up two different things. The seven days of killing is um, part of the smaller cycles. Like there's a cycle of the whole oh. earth, but then there's like for the human race, there's in, in the history of the whole earth, there's going to be 18 up and downs. And the down, there's actually different kinds of bottoming out depending on the prevailing defilement. When ill will is the prevailing defilement, then it'll be a sword time and people will kill each other. And then they'll be mostly reborn in hell. And that's supposed to be happening next time. Like So that's what we're heading towards. If um, desire is the prevailing uh, defilement, then the ending will be in, in a famine. Um, and beings will mostly be reborn as hungry ghosts. And if uh, ignorance or delusion is the prevailing passion, then uh, it'll be a plague or pestilence that kills everybody off. And those beings will mostly be reborn in the Dewa world because at the very end, they'll have compassion for each other when they see each other sick. And is it that one can escape the, the horrors of the end of the world by attaining states that yeah if you're reborn into the higher Brahma realms then you know you're not if you get at least the second jhana you'll escape the next destruction you're you know you're reborn in second jhana's uh, basara brahma and <laughs> you're just watching from there as everybody burns up <laughs> <laughs> and and what is it that ends everything well the the the, the, the widest destruction is that ends the whole world system is by wind it blows everything apart, I guess. But it doesn't have anything to do with morality. No, those are like natural cycles. They're not based on morality. They just, that's what world systems do. That's when you develop equanimity. No, I thought, of, I thought that of an interesting parallel to modern science with these destructions at three different levels. The destruction by fire is said to happen when the seven suns in the sky. The sun will multiply and it'll burn up. It'll start burning everything up. And it is predicted by modern science that the solar system will end when the sun goes red giant. The sun gets it doesn't multiply itself, but it becomes huge. And that destroys one solar system. So like one small circle. And then the next bigger circle could be when um, the entire galaxy is destroyed, which eventually the whole galaxy is like going down the drain. It's that shape, you know, that kind of spiral. That's spiraling like when you pull the plug in a bathtub. It's spiraling down into the black hole at the center of the galaxy. And that's like an analogy to water, right? And then when the whole universe of all the galaxies ends by uh, uh, dispersion, that's like the wind blowing them, mm. blowing them out, it's like the heat death of the universe. So why does it start all over from there? The Kama. So like beings from the fourth realm descend? Yep. Yeah, because of the Kama generates a new... The, they said the world system is generated by the Kama of the beings from the previous world system. Right. So there's no beginning to all of this, but there are beings that get out, such as the Buddha himself. Yes. Is it conceivable that this whole system will, can, at least in principle, end? No. Then how did the Buddha... Samsara is, is inexhaustible. Well, it's without beginning. But it does have an end. Well, not everybody can get out. Not for everybody. Why not? For in the principle. Buddha. In principle, why not? 
It's like Ajahn Chah said, don't, uh, uh, it's like a worm worrying about running out of dirt. If well. samsara is infinite, it doesn't matter, you could have an infinite number of people become enlightened and still be an <clears> infinite <throat> number left. Huh? You subtract an infinity from an infinity. Well, an infinite beginning, but clear end. No. For the Buddha there was. Yeah, for on an individual level. But samsara itself, they can't be conceive of a beginning or an end. In time. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, so it's the same for the individual. The Buddha had no beginning in time, but he had a clear end. Well, he had a beginning in time as the Buddha. He became the Buddha at a specific moment. Yes, but his samsaric existence had no beginning in time. Right, right. Oh, that's actually a, a, a related tangential question. There's seven Buddhas that are traditionally accounted for in history? For, uh, uh, five. Five. In the Theravada system. There are other counts in different schools. Right. But five in this, in this world system. Okay. Is there supposed to be, like, if you go through other world systems, an infinite line back? We just don't have... Yes. Like yeah. Name. Well, there is, like, there, we do actually have names in from... Various sources. Some of them are actually in the canon, but most of them from the commentaries. I've seen a list that goes back like, you know, 40, 50 Buddhists. Right. But that's going back into previous world systems that don't exist now. Gotcha. And there was a, uh, an interesting kind of controversy in, in the sources that it was clear the Buddha stated himself that it's impossible for there to be more than one Buddha in a world system at one time. And then the commentary expanded that to say there could not be a more than one Buddha in a 10,000 world systems, which was considered kind of a unit, a 10,000 full world system. It's like you group 10,000 world systems and that's like, that's under one, one Brahma world. There's 10,000 earths. And, um, the commentary said one Buddha can only exist in 10,000 world systems, but then a later, a later text says actually there can only be one Buddha in the entire universe at once. So then this goes, this is like the opposite extreme from some of the Mahayana who multiply Buddhas endlessly and, and, and all beings, I think it's some Zen saying all Buddhas beings from beginningless time. Yeah, philosophical difference about what Nirvana is. Mm. Everything's a Buddha, including the incense behind you. Mm. One of Kema Ananda's kind of playful, uh, playful mantras that he he taught us. I really like. Oh, I, I still like this one. It would, is uh, here a Buddha, there a Buddha, everywhere a Buddha, Buddha. I'm a Buddha, you're a Buddha, everyone's a Buddha, Buddha. <laughs> <laughs> Is it in the in the Lotus Sutra, or I'm thinking of something else, where there's a, a Buddha on every blade of grass? Lotus Sutra has stuff like that. I don't yeah. know if that exact phrase is there, but um, mm. well, if that early Mahayana literature is just constantly emphasizing the infinite number of Buddhas. Whereas the whole trend in Theravada is always to make it more rare and. The ex stress the extreme rarity of the state of Buddhahood. It has to do, uh, the difference has to do with the transcendent versus the imminent. This mm -hmm. idea of nirvana mm -hmm. as a, a calico, timeless thing outside of this cycle. Yes. Uh, we don't, in Mahayana, posit an outside. Mm -hmm. The question is more just like, what is waking up? Is it a 
way out, or is it an awareness? You guys would say both. But on the other hand, and this is something that's curious, I don't have a real explanation for it, it's a historical development. There is that, I see what you're saying with the transcendent imminent division there, and that, yeah, that makes sense. But at the same time, the historical trend in Mahayana was always to make the Buddha more transcendent. So you have the the doctrine that the Buddha never left to sheet to heaven. That it was only a nimitta form that appeared on the earth to teach. Uh, so if you read the Lotus Sutra carefully, uh, there's a lot of points where it asks people with discernment to question its claims. Um, it explicitly says intelligent people will take this a different way than those of less mm. discernment. Um, it uh, it was a very radical philosophical transformation, but it, it tells you up front, I will lie to you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, uh, it actually kind of goes like some people like say that uh, Mahayana is just so crazily mythological compared to early Buddhism, but it's sort of um, it's almost. I'm speaking from a Zen perspective here, by the way. We, this mm. is how we interpret it. Um, but it's sort of seen as a way of demanding skepticism from people who would be prone to questioning those sorts of extreme mythological narratives. Um, and it's trying to ask, well, what does it mean that there are Buddhas everywhere? Yeah, well, that could be that the Zen, the Zen people took it that way. But I don't get the feeling that the early Mahayanas did. I think they were quite serious about the idea that, that the Buddha was was not human in any real sense. Well, they would say that still. They don't identify the Buddha with a human anymore. They identify the Buddha with uh, just the metaphysical structure of reality itself. Hmm. Um, and it's it's been a, it's been a little while since I checked the Lotus Sutra, but it does explicitly say people with discernment will take this differently from mm. people of low discernment. Mm. Um, it really is trying to push that noble lie kind of thing, but it's doing its best to hint like you should not take me at face value here. Mm. Okay. So. <sighs> check this for myself but I was told by a monk who was uh, who was quite uh, quite gifted with with linguistics and he could you know he, he, he knew how to read Chinese and he said that in the um, Chinese version of the Mahaparinibbana Sutta it takes out the bit about the Buddha suffering from suffering from dysentery because they you know they want to not see like the Buddha having diarrhea was not was too gross for them to mm-hmm. contemplate. Too real. Yeah. Yeah. In Zen, we very determinedly pulled that kind of thing back. Not only yeah. did he have dysentery, he was dysentery. <laughs> well, yeah. There was Zen. I see Zen as kind of a reform movement that was, you know, at least a, a partial movement back towards the roots, kind of cutting through the exuberance of the early Mahayana that seemed to go, to me, to go right off the deep end. No, I, mean, I, I, I guess like the, the, the reason that I find this question pertinent is just because um, uh, in Theravada Abhidhamma, as I understand it from learning under you, there is a certain transcendental bent. There is an idea that Nirvana is existent, it is an unconditioned, it's outside of time. Yes. Um, and it's not annihilation. Yes. Uh, but it doesn't seem to uh, say much more than that. It doesn't give an account in which way it is not annihilation. Um, it seems to um, it seems to almost imply, but very much dislike people insinuating that it is some sort of non-creative godhead or something. No, like that. no, because it's not a causal factor. 
Yes. And it's utterly outside of logical categories. So to call it existent or non-existent is a meaningless question. Well, outside of existence in terms of bhava? In terms of, uh, in terms of existence, non-existence, both or neither. There's that sutta where the Buddha is explicit about that with the, with the sandaka, the wanderer sandaka. He says it's neither existent nor non-existent nor both nor neither. So it's just like it, which means it's outside of logical categories. Those are the four poles of Indian logic. So it can't be spoken of. And you try to kind of hem it in with definitions, you're always going to fail. I'd say that that is, I, 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 I like that bit quite a lot, but here's where... Well, you still want to try and define it. <laughs> well, not so much. It's more like because there is a claim in Theravada that it is outside of existence, that would be... Well, it's the... outside of conditioned existence, for sure. Yes, but it's still sort of... I, I guess the reason there was that sort of bent towards imminent, uh, imminentism is because it saw that as sort of... Uh, uh, an inadequacy to the outside of logical categories claim, just saying that it's outside of existence. It's uh, it seems as though it is not quite living up to that uh, radical ineffability. Well, that's kind of interesting. I hadn't looked at it that way, but the way I see it, and I think the Theravada position is that. All those kind of terminologies are only apply to the conditioned, and it's best to leave the unconditioned, not even to try and attempt to define it or categorize it. It's outside of all of that. It's other. It's not. It's not something we can grasp with the ordinary mind. Yeah, we would agree with that. It's just that we would say that uh, it's not so much that it's outside of it. It's just that ordinary mind is constructing things that are not adequate to it. Mm. Okay, uh, it's getting well after nine. Let me end it up so people can get home in a reasonable time. An opportunity. Phil at work. I am um, copying both of those recorders onto a flash drive for you? Yes. It's really helpful seeing yourself being after you've been recorded. So on the 14th, you've got these two, me and...